going on everybody john matrix here hope you're having yourselves a wonderful day we're going to be jumping into the 40k universe here today with scholars lore as, as our guide uh we're going to check out life on a forge world 40k lore so uh like i said this is going to be a video from the scholars lore links down below in the description to the original video here without my commentary and reaction and to the scholars lore's channel so if you do me a favor click those links if you like this video give it a like Check out his content. If you like his content, give the man a sub. Makes a lot of great 40K content and definitely deserves some love. Uh, so yeah, we're doing this for my YouTube members, as you can see. If you'd like to come in here and join our discussions, we would love to have you come in here and do that. Uh, you can also get early access to my videos up to a week uh, beforehand, uh, as well as access to uh, specific sub channel dis uh, sub channels, my Discord, et cetera, et cetera, as well as a lot of other benefits. So if you would like to take your support to the next level, uh, click that join button down below and see uh, if any of those tiers would have any interest for you. Regardless, I just appreciate you guys taking the time out of your busy day to come in, check out the videos, and uh, yeah, it's all the support that I really need, honestly. That and maybe a little like. So uh, let's uh, get into this here video again. This is Life on a Forge World 40k Lore by the Scholar's Lore. Uh, hit the button there. Volume up. Let's go. Scattered throughout the galaxy, we will find innumerable homes to the Cult Mechanicus, all situated on their independently governed Forge worlds. Now, I know what Hive worlds are like, and I feel like living on Hive world would absolutely suck. I, I, I could extrapolate, I guess, the idea of what living on a Forge world would be like as well. Um... I feel like most worlds that you live on in the Imperium, you're going to be pretty much constantly working your ass off. Uh, I feel like that some uh, of all of like the worlds where you'd be working a ton, I feel like the farm worlds might be overall some of the better worlds just because at least you're, you know, above ground where there's actual like sun and, and air and space where you're working. You know, I'd rather be working out in a field farming produce and stuff like that even though you're still probably really busting your ass and, you know, you have quotas and schedules and all that kind of stuff to keep, at least there's, you know, nature and air and sunlight as opposed to being just stuck underground and some, you know, manufactorum or whatever. But um, I would think life on a forge world compared to a hive world wouldn't be quite so bad, you know? And I would think that, um, you know... There'd be at least a lot more room to advance, maybe potentially, you know, with what you're doing, if uh, your work is well enough. I don't know. I guess we'll find out. But uh, I, I, I think it would be, you know, pretty hot and shitty still, because obviously you're in the forge world and you're forging things. But who knows? That might not bother uh, tech priests all that much or mechanicans. So anyway, let's continue. These planets have an incredibly dense populace with millions or even billions of humans working alongside countless servitors and mechanized units, all for yeah. the furtherment of the Forge world's industrial output. Yeah, I'm sure OSHA, I'm sure every Forge world is like, there's nothing compliant with OSHA. I'm sure. The purpose of these worlds is simple. It is to produce the arms and armaments for the armies of the Imperium. Planets are often incredibly specialized towards the crafting of a specific piece of equipment or class of technology. So for some worlds, entire continents may be dedicated to the production of LAS guns, where hundreds of thousands will be produced each day for the mighty bear, which is the Imperial Guard. Alternatively, some worlds will be formulated towards the artisanal production of the God engines of the Collegia Titanica, and they... See, I would think that working on creating and forging titans would be dope. If I had to work on the forge world and I had a choice on what to work on, I would probably want to work on these. Because, I mean, you're making these giant towering mech relics, dude, or repairing these giant towering mech relics. And, I mean, I even, you know, not being a tech priest would think it would, like, how much of an honor and how cool it would be to work and repair these things. And I, I just think it would be dope. It would be dope. It'd be dope to build one of these things and just, you know, I guess get a look at as much of the inner workings of it as you possibly could. You know what I mean? I would be fascinating and fascinated, uh, you know, learning about these. You may only produce 
destruction of the god engines of the Collegia Titanica, and they may only produce a single titan following several decades of meticulous yeah. labor. As stated, the planets are governed independently from the Imperium, and they strictly adhere only to the rulings and decrees of the Adeptus Mechanicus. This is due to the 10,000-year-old Treaty of Mars, which was signed by both the Emperor of Mankind and of the Mechanicus leaders during the 30th millennium as a method of avoiding war between Terra and Mars. So I wonder what would happen if the Emperor actually did finally die to that treaty, right? Because is, is, be is the treaty between the Mechanicus and specifically the Emperor or Mechanicus and the Imperium? Or has that been like amended and updated as time has gone by since everything that's happened, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, yeah, but I would be curious because if it's like, if it's specifically an alliance with the emperor, I mean, I guess it technically could be implied that the emperor is the Imperium. But then again, if that is the case and the emperor actually dies, then you could say that the Imperium is dead. You know what I mean? So would that then not make that contract void? But yeah, I would just be, I, I would be curious as the wording of that and and I guess the substance of that that uh, um, contract, the uh, the alliance that was forged, if it's specifically with the emperor or with the imperium, and should the emperor actually finally die, what would happen with it? I would think probably not much, right? I would think they would probably remain status quo for the most part because they've just been so used to it for so long, but. Who knows, there might be some people that would rise up and say, hey, he's not the Omnisci, because obviously he's dead. Um, if word were to, you know, actually spread that the Emperor has finally died, you know, it could cause another uprising and, you know, potentially another offshoots of religious sects or whatever, I guess, from from the, the, the Mechanicum could uh, try to rise up and seek power and overthrow things, change things, and who knows? Who knows what would happen? But anyway, continue. It decreed that the planets colonized by the Mechanicus could remain under the sovereign rule of Mars and that each planet would hold political autonomy from the laws of the Imperium. It also included an exception to the Imperial truth, the quasi-religion of the Imperium, which allowed the Mechanicus to continue in their worship of the machine god. There is much theological debate over this next point, but some within the Mechanicus have willingly conflated the Emperor as being the Omnissiah, mm -hmm. which would make him the physical avatar of the machine god. This theory, however, seems to satisfy neither the adherents to the Imperial cult, nor of those who follow the cult Mechanicus. However, I shall not dwell on the mechanoid ravings of the Martians today. The mechanoid ravings. In any case, a stipulation of this treaty is that the Mechanicus would supply the Imperium with whatever armaments, ships, materials, weapons, and technicians that they required. This request has happily been filled. As for the Mechanicus, nothing brings them more joy than right. the production and Actually discovery of new technologies, all of which bring them closer to their machine god. Forge worlds are incredibly hostile planets to live upon, sometimes being comparable to a death world in just how inhospitable they seem. You know, it makes me wonder, like, how many times has, you know, a regular Joe Schmo guy in the Mechanicum, you know, working on something and he has some kind of breakthrough or whatever on technology, but, you know, because of how rigorous they are with new creations and technologies and stuff like that like you get just like potentially deemed as a heretic and punished or killed or whatever because of it and, like i wonder how often that actually does happen you know they might come up with an idea or accidentally create something that's an offshoot that might be deemed heretical you know uh, and, and even though it would be something that would actually be beneficial you know it gets uh it's not used essentially, maybe swept under the rug, I guess would be, you know, a good way of putting it in that person uh, arrested or punished in some way. Landscapes have been utterly 
terraformed for the benefit of the great mechanical machines, which yeah. constantly belch out thick black smog and other industrial pollutants, all so that the engine of production never ceases to function. Mountains have been reduced to rubble, just so that new factories can be produced in their foundations. Didn't the Mechanicus, like, flatten an entire continent uh, for the procession parade to happen after the Olinor uh, victory for the Emperor and Horus, where Horus was, like, culminated the War Master? Didn't, didn't the Mechanicus do something crazy like that to, like... Yeah, they, like... From what I remember, they, they like, flattened the whole continent in order to uh, allow for the Emperor to have a, a parade in front of everyone to culminate the victory in um, Horus's crowning as the War Master. It was something like that. Entire swathes of what was previously verdant grasslands have been dug up, and enormous tunnels have been dug underneath, purely to store the vast coolant systems which prevent these factories from overheating. Even more natural features of a planet will be taken and mechanically modified to suit the needs of the machine. Volcanoes will be adapted into massive furnaces, with the very core of the planet being stoked to produce greater and more intense heats. Vast chimneys will stand as tall as space elevators, spewing polluted materials into the upper atmosphere, where they will coalesce into thick clouds, enveloping the planet within a grim, dark sheath of pollution. Yummy. Oceans will be drained, with their waters being carelessly distributed across the world to aid in whatever industrial processes require them, with not a thought being paid for the ecological devastation which is being committed. As you can imagine, this has turned many lush, diverse ecosystems and many beautiful mm -hmm. verdant planets into nothing but worlds of pure industrial wasteland, broken up only by the towering and lumbering manufacturums which pock and scar its horizon. The constant swell of forges, the churning of raw materials, and the roar of a million industrial engines produces an incomprehensible level of pollution upon the planet. I bet. Indigenous life is almost entirely eradicated, with only the hardiest and most resilient of insects somehow surviving deep within the irradiated sands. Acid rain is a common and near constant phenomenon halted only by atmospheric scrubbers, which are sparingly activated by the Mechanicus overlords. And again, like, maybe it's just a situation of not using the, not wanting to utilize the resources necessary to clean some of the stuff up. We would think with the technology they would have, because it is far more advanced though than what we do have currently, that they would have technologies that could, uh, reduce or convert those pollutants into other things that could be usable you know what i mean like you know I, I i don't know various you know exhaust gases that get let out could be can used converted into some other kind of energy source or something else or you know spaceships and travel or who knows you know you would think that they would want to be with, with how scarce things can be you would think they would want to be as efficient and utilizing everything they can, which also would include whatever kind of waste gets produced from their uh, forging processes, etc. Harsh winds carry immense sandstorms with them, and thanks to the sheer level of industry upon the planet, small shards of metal and glass are almost always carried within the sand, making them incredibly yeah, dangerous suck. for any unarmored, uncovered individuals lost within the roaring dust clouds. Some planets will be dedicated to the production of weapons or machinery which require the use of radioactive materials. These worlds can become so saturated by radiation that they are simply uninhabitable to humans, and as such, they are completely relegated to being operated by servitors, highly mm. modified tech priests and Skitari forces. It does not dissuade the Mechanicus to rule over an irradiated world, so long as they can continue in the production of their mechanical wonders and that the radiation does not result in a reduction in their industrial output. 
You know, they, they would. I, I would think, I mean, and maybe they have backups for this kind of stuff, but like, so far from what he's saying is like, it sounds like specific worlds are tasked with specific things. Like, you know, one world might be specifically there to make uh, specific, you know, LAS guns and the various types of LAS guns and maybe the battery packs for the LAS guns. Like one world might be specifically for that. One world might be specifically for creating, repairing, you know, manufacturing Titans or Dreadnoughts or, you know, whatever. So it's like you would think that they would want to spread that kind of, you know, technology and resources out amongst other worlds as, you know, a situation where you don't want to keep all your eggs in one basket kind of a thing. So if for whatever reason the Forge world gets taken over, destroyed, some kind of virus takes over and threatens the world, Another AI situation somehow happens, gets out, whatever, and, and takes over the world, a demon incursion, yada, yada. That technology, you know, and whatnot isn't lost, you know? But I would assume that they would have databases throughout the various Forge worlds of a lot of this technology that they are uh, able to reproduce and replicate, you know, so that doesn't happen. But I don't know. Maybe I'm incorrect. Then it will not result they can continue in the production of their mechanical wonders and that the radiation does not result in a reduction in their industrial output. Then it will not bother them. All they will need to change is to implement a rad scrubbing protocol for all exported True. materials and production will resume with haste. Technology upon these worlds is found in abundance but it is kept under the shroud of fear, where most will be kept far from understanding its true workings. Tech priests will patrol the foundries, shouting binary chants at the machines, and wafting strange pungent censors, which spew with foul-smelling incense, all with the intent of quelling the various machine spirits believed to reside within many of the pieces of ancient technology found across the world. Now, that is kind of a big theme throughout the Imperium uh, and the Mechanicus, you know, in general, is that the idea of ignorance is bliss. It seems like they want people to be smart enough and capable enough of doing, you know, basic certain things. And then beyond that, they, again, ignorance is bliss. They don't want you to know because then knowledge could become dangerous, like knowledge of the warp and, and demons and what that could mean and knowledge of technology and, you know, experimenting with things that could, again, lead to uh, chaos incursions or viral issues or AI issues, et cetera, et cetera. So it's like, and again, some of it is justified from a certain point of view, because again, you know, demon incursions are real, you know, technology being corrupted and turning against humans is real, et cetera, et cetera. So there is some justification to it, but it's also, you know, it's one of those catch 22 situations where like there is no real progression happening because of the fear of what could potentially happen instead of, you know, moving forward and dealing with the issues as they come up kind of a situation. Some of these technologies utilized on the forge worlds are incredibly rare and are seldom found anywhere else within the galaxy. Entire cities or foundries may be built upon tracks which constantly carry the structure across the planet's surface just mm. to move it away from the pollution which it has produced. Huge sky cranes and space elevators jut out from the planet's surface, connecting to orbital ring structures which surround the world like a skeletal mechanical halo. This is often where spaceports and right. orbital docks will be found. And it say. is here that new ships of the Imperial Navy will be produced en masse. The canvas of the planet will be partitioned assume. and divided, broken up into sprawling foundries, each a domain of pure and ceaseless industry. They will be dedicated to a small part of something greater than themselves. A factory may produce nothing but a single screw, but rest assured, if the Mechanicus decrees that it is a vital piece, then that factory will remain in use for the foreseeable future, almost certainly outlasting the lives of the poor workers within it. 
I would assume that the different factories in Forum's Worlds 2 could be easily converted to create other things should old technologies be deemed not useful or not needed anymore. They could then, you know, swap things out so that new things could be made if, you know, a newer version of a LAS gun or if LAS guns become obsolete altogether and a new type of, you know, main weapon is to be made for the, the, the guardsmen. They could update those forges to then just make those without much of a problem. Even if one was to stand upon a forge world and look up at the factories and forge complexes around them, then they would still struggle to grasp the actual scale of what has been erected here. He said erected. Industrial production zones seem to stretch out endlessly with the constant humming and crashing of gigantic pneumatic presses and the harsh cracks of arc cutters providing a heavy and unavoidable ambiance to the planet. Ambiance. Within these sprawling foundries, <coughs> one can quickly become lost if they stray from their work detail. I bet. The labyrinthine corridors and supply routes seem to spread and cross each other like a crude metallic vascular system, all of which keep the hulking behemoth of industry ever pumping. The constant and acrid smell of burnt Prometheum will mix with the overwhelming tang of steel dust within the workshops. Isn't Prometheum kind of like the, the main metal alloy they, they use to make everything from? They're like fi fictional, like titanium or something like that. Resulting in the air itself becoming an inescapable hazard to those who would work without an advanced rebreather system. Deeper within, the harsh glow from the streams of molten metals is so dazzling that it would scorch the eyes of any fools who would look upon the exposed heart of the forge. Living in the shadow of the machine, is an incredibly harsh and unenviable existence. Humans born upon these worlds are collected and quantified by the biologist tech priests who will record every aspect of the child in order to determine their best position within the forge world. Only in special select circumstances will this be done based on physical ability. For most, they are to be given a role wherever one is required and upon growing to a suitable age, they will leave their families or orphanages to take up their tools and will live the rest of their lives in constant labor. During childhood or even early adolescence, some promising individuals may be taken away for induction within the holy temples of the machine god. Here, they will take up the teachings of the tech priests and in time, they will join their ranks as a fully fledged member of the cult mechanicus. So what happens if someone like is in a family of like tech priests, et cetera, et cetera, and they don't want to get the implants happen. You know, they don't, they want to stay, you know, natural, I guess you could say, is that, would that be considered heretical then? You know, would they be like shunned, disowned, et cetera? Would they be like just forced to get them done? Would they be like turned to servitors or, would they be made to do something else? Would they just get thrown to the Imperial Guard as another, you know, body uh, to be a meat shield kind of a situation? Like, how would that work? Before long, those fervent followers will begin to cybernetically replace aspects of their body with mechanical components. They are taught to despise the weakness of oh, flesh stop yawning. and instilled within them will be a holy mission of aspiring towards becoming fully cybernetic, all to bring them closer to the blessed machine. Some children who are seen to be particularly physically gifted will be removed from the worker pools and will be placed within initiation and training camps for the Skitari. These young soldiers will begin their harsh physical training regiments where the strongest and most able will be recruited into the cybernetic legions of the Mechanicus. Here, they will be enhanced with mechanical implants and prosthetics, allowing them to stand as strong and capable cyborg warriors, ready to carry the teachings of the Omnissiah into battle. Is the tech marines? Skitari will patrol the forge worlds, helping to maintain order 
and will act as a defense force should any foes attempt to invade the planet. They will also act as the bodyguards to senior tech priests on explorator missions, where the Mechanicus will send an expedition to a long-lost world in the pursuit of promising rumors of ancient technologies, or even a fabled STC fragment. Now, not every human will be born with the ability to carry out the previously discussed roles, and some may fail during their training, or even become injured and incapable from working in the dangerous foundries. Life and labor will not cease for and these individuals. Any human can be modified into a servitor should their bodies begin to fail them. That'd be one of the worst fates I can think of in the 40k universe. Like, I'd rather just be eaten by a tyrannid and have it get over with. Like, this be, be, being turned into a servitor, the only other thing so far that I've, I've, I can think of. Well, I guess maybe there'd be two things. Either getting captured by, you know, Slanesh, you know, some kind of demons, uh, you know, demons of Slanesh, or uh, the Dark Eldar, the Drakari, like, that would be pretty bad too. But essentially, like, being trapped in your own body and having your body told to do things and you're not able to essentially, like, you're aware of what's going on, but not able to do anything about it and just essentially being trapped in your own body and kept alive longer you know, through cybernetic implants and whatever else, like, that would be terrible. This may start with simple prosthetic replacements for lost limbs, but for some who have committed crimes against the Omnisire, or for those who have become too damaged to fully save, then their brains can also be replaced by cybernetic implants, making them mindless lobotomized workers, who will remain in use until they eventually and inevitably expire. Once a human or servitor finally breaks down for the final time and is unable to be rebuilt into a labor unit, then their bodies will be harvested and reclaimed for what few valuable resources remain upon it. Cybernetic components will be sterilized and replaced on others, destined to become servitors themselves, Organic components will be shipped off for the production of fertilizer or corpse starch, and Ow. some will simply be thrown into the furnaces, with the last remaining vestiges of energy within their cells being burnt up to fuel the fires of the forge. It is not all doom and gloom, however. For the humans who work in these factories and meet their quotas, they are free to roam and live their lives however they wish within their assigned hab blocks. They can keep whatever memorabilia they want and can commingle with other menial laborers, forming friends and families with whoever takes their fancy. Truly, they are free so long as they maintain production levels and do not interfere with the strange, esoteric pursuits of the ruling tech priests. For the Mechanicus Overseers and Ruling Magi, they busy themselves with the management of factories and foundries, ensuring that all quotas are met and that production never ceases. Mm -hmm. They delve themselves into the arcana of the cult Mechanicus, finding new ways to worship the Omnissiah, often by replacing more and more of their physical bodies with implants until they resemble nothing but a hulking mass of machinery with odd limbs and coils jutting from their hunched and burdened frames. Due to the sheer level of advanced technologies found upon the planet, you may think that most people are familiar with these esoteric components and tools. However, this is far from the case. However, this is far from the case. Even upon these worlds, the right. Imperium still fears people of advanced technologies found upon the planet. You may think that most people are familiar with these esoteric components and tools. However, this is far, far from, from the case. case. But this is far from the However, case. However, this is far from the case. I, okay, I want to make sure. These worlds, the I, just, still I just wanted to make sure I wasn't like having a stroke for some reason. I was like, didn't he just say that? The, the, okay, okay, he had some kind of like a little accidental repeat there in, in his, his uh, 
his script. So I just wanted to make sure I wasn't going crazy. Still fears technology in the case. Even upon these worlds, the Imperium still fears technology, and so the vast majority of menial workers do their best to distance themselves from that which they do not understand. If a worker was found to be in the possession of a piece of forbidden technology, then in all likelihoods it would be confiscated, and all workers within their section of the HAB block will be sent to become mindless servitors just to Rip. ensure that no trace of tech heresy would taint the planet. Mm -hmm. All across the Forge worlds, you will hear the ever-present hum of cogitators, the blazing roars of continent-spanning furnaces, and the clanking, thumping sounds of forges carving metals into new frames of war. The offensive smell of sulfur and ash is a universal malady, which most simply adapt yeah. to until their sensory organs fail them. Necess yeah, I was gonna say, that's probably just something you just gotta get used to until your fucking sense of smell gets burnt out or whatever, or gets replaced mechanically. Which most simply adapt to until their sensory organs fail them necessitating a cybernetic replacement of their entire olfactory tract. These worlds stand to fuel the war machine of the Imperium and to continue in the teachings and worship of the Omnissiah. That would be kind of interesting if you think about it, like having a cybernetic implant to replace your sense of smell. First off, how would you know if a cybernetic implant is able to get the smell correct, right? You know what I mean? Like, how is it able to interpret what the smell of chicken, you know, cooked ch chicken would be compared to, like, a cooked piece of steak? Not that they would have, you know, access to those kind of meals in this universe, but I'm just, you know, using that as an example. But then also, it would be interesting of the fact that, like, what if you had some kind of dial where you could, like, turn the sense, you know, up, but you could make the smell more intense. You could smell things even greater than what you would be normally used to or turn it down you know so i mean you know if someone takes a fart in the room just like brrr, turn that down now you ain't gotta smell it it doesn't bother you you know what i'm saying Imperium, and to continue in the teachings and worship of the omnissiah each planet is but a cog in the mighty mechanical engine which makes up the adeptus mechanicus and even though it may seem entirely unpleasant to live upon one they are a vital part of the entire Imperium, and their hardy inhabitants should always be looked upon with respect and honor. Praise be the Omnissiah. Praise be the Omnissiah. All right, well, there we have it. That was Life in a Forge World 40k Lore by the Scholar's Lore. So, I mean, in all honesty, Probably not a whole lot different, really, than life in a Forge world. It's just doing different things, uh, and I guess just a different way of life based on, like, A, I guess what you're doing on, on the different worlds, you know what I mean? Plus, you have a different religious kind of uh, background on, on Forge worlds. You know, Forge worlds are run by the Mechanicus, so if you grow up and work on a Forge world, then more than likely you're a part of the Mechanicus. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So you're going to be part of, you know, that religion and uh, all of that as as compared to, you know, a Forge world where uh, more than likely there is no real religion other than, I guess, maybe some cult of the emperor or some other kinds of uh, hidden cults, which will uh, be extremely frowned upon and uh, more than likely will get hunted down and killed by arbiters or inquisitors, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it, I think overall it would probably be a better life working on a Forge world. Uh, it didn't sound like there's really a whole lot of a, a criminal element on Forge worlds in comparison to Hive worlds. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you just didn't really get uh, over, you know, into that into this video. But it could also just be because of the way of life with um, the ideals and religion of the Mechanicus. Uh, and, and, you know, knowing what's expected of you early on, et cetera, et cetera, uh, as compared to, um, you know, and, and plus, I mean, once you start getting the implants and stuff like that, your kind of way of thinking and being is more based around logic, I guess, instead of, uh, emotional based, 
So, you know, I think that would also play a big factor in that. Um, it sounds like, you know, maybe they would have more freedoms overall, like as long as he said, you know, you're meeting your quotas, then you're free to do what you want, associate with who you want, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it sounds like, I guess, potentially the only real maybe criminal-ish kind of element there might be would be is if someone gets into some kind of technology they're not supposed to, creating or experimenting with technologies they're not supposed to, et cetera, et cetera which then can, you know, turn into that technology getting confiscated and then and anyone uh, in the, the living block or related to them would then be taken and probably turned into servitors, etc., etc. So I guess overall, maybe probably a, a, a better quality of life than most hive worlds. But again, I guess it probably depends on the hive world and what the hive world's doing, what the world is used for because I believe some hive worlds are actually like farm hive worlds and there might actually be uh, a chance for you to, you know, go somewhere where there is, you know, some kind of nature, life, sun, uh, you know, real air that's not polluted and shitty and, you know, not living on a desolate industrial world kind of a thing. So, uh, but yeah, that's going to do it for this one, guys. Again, that was uh, Life on a Forge World. 40k lore by the scholars lore links will be down in the description to the scholars lore's channel and to this video without my commentary and reaction do me a favor and click on those links go check out the scholars lore's channel he makes a lot of great 40k content so if you enjoy his content give the man some love give him a sub uh i believe he's also got a patreon uh yes he does he's got a patreon so go over there check out his patreon if you'd like to support him uh monetarily um but yeah, go over there and give them some love, give the video a like, etc, etc. We're doing this reaction live for my YouTube members. If you'd like to join in with these live reactions, uh, join our discussions that we have before, during, and after. We'd love to have you guys come in here and hear your opinions on things. Join the discussions. There's a join button down below. You can click that. See if any of the YouTube membership benefit tiers that I offer have any interest for you. You can get uh, videos up to uh, a week early, uh, as well as access to sub discord channels and uh, a bunch of other things so check it out see if it'll be interesting if you have any interest in taking your support to the next level and helping me out monetarily uh doing so will obviously allow me to continue to focus on creating youtube content for you guys uh regardless i really just appreciate you taking the time out of your busy day to come in hang out watch the videos and uh yeah if you liked the video consider leaving a like and a sub as it helps me and helps the channel grow the, the best way you can support me for free and I greatly, greatly appreciate you guys doing that. It means a lot. Hope you're having yourselves a wonderful day whenever you're watching this. We'll see you on the next one.